Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the late delay. We're just waiting for um, um, a few last people to, to sign in. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, um, which I've just realized is a very long titled one, um, how the right data storage provider solves your business's GDPR security and breach compliance problems. Um, it's a joint webinar between um, myself, um, my name is Mark Gracie from Digital Compliance Hub, um, and um, with Storm Internet. Um, just to let you know, um, we're recording the session um, and we'll supply a, a, a link to a video of the um, session afterwards. And also, if you have any questions, we'll have a, a question and answer session towards the end. Um, and uh, you control panel a, a, a tab for questions. Um, feel free to type something in there and then uh, we'll pick those up um, at, at the end. So, um, as I said, my name is Mark Gracie. Um, I run a digital consultancy called Flavify Digital, specialising in, in data compliance and, for obvious reasons, uh, GDPR at the moment. Um, and I also run an online service, which is what uh, we, um, how I'm promoting this. I've been promoting this webinar, um, which is called the Digital Compliance Hub. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, to, towards the end. The uh, webinar is very much. Uh, a thing of two parts so I'm going to talk about some of the GDPR basics and and look at some of the things to, to think about uh, um, a uh, strictly a, a full overview of what's changing with GDPR and GDPR covers quite a large range of uh, different topics and subjects but I'll talk for roughly around 20 minutes and then uh, Celine Benadel from uh, Storm Internet will take over and uh, talk about the more practical application of what his uh, business has done um, with regards to GDPR compliance and answers that question that's in the title about how um, uh, choosing the right hosting provider can so hopefully um, you can see the slides and uh, if you're um, looking at your screen you should see um, a picture of both um, myself and, and Salim so um, let's get started so as I said, by, by the end, well, so we're going to talk about GDPR and, and also sort of practical applications, but by the end, you should have a, an understanding of what the GDPR security uh, issues are and what the aspects of GDPR relating to security um, are for you to think about. Hopefully, then you'll know whether you need to worry about some of these things, and if you do, um, a, a few sort of tips and, and pointers to um, what you can do to meet uh, compliance requirements. But first, let's just make sure we're all on the on the same page when it comes to data protection because GDPR is about data protection and we've had a data protection law for the last uh, 20 ish years 1998 act um, was the uh, European uh, implementation of a, a um, sorry a UK implementation of the European data protection directive um, so let's just uh, just want to cover off a, a couple of things because I, I tend to certainly when I, I talk about data protection tend to use uh, key uh, terms and things like that so it's uh, worth just uh, making sure that we we know what we're talking about so uh, definitions uh, the GDPR has got quite a few um, probably not enough in in some areas but um, generally speaking there's there's quite a few in on the regulation but the key things um, to think about when we talk about data protection are the five that you should see on your screen now um, We've got personal data, which just for clarity is is um, what data protection is all about. And it's the data that r relates to a living individual. So if you have data either directly or indirectly that enables you to identify an individual, then you have personal data. And that doesn't matter whether that's a, a, a consumer or an individual in their private lives um, and, and, or whether it's a, um, an employee within a business. So if you have employees, their data is um, considered personal data and data protection applies. But equally, if you um, say market to um, individuals within the business, then their data also is personal data. So even if you're in a B2B environment, you will probably have personal data and therefore data protection applies. Processing is quite a wide term relating to the use of data and everything you might do with it. Uh, and it's important to consider um, what that um, actually uh, means um, because it covers quite a a wide range of um, different aspects of um, um, sorry somebody just asked that it's muted by an organizer so we've got two organizers and one of them's muted so hopefully you can uh, hear me okay um, nobody's saying other words so sorry for that brief interruption um, so processing is about all your uses of data and it's important to understand it because it covers a wide range of 
different aspects of processing, which uh, is not just about the use of it that you've collected it for, um, for originally, but it's about the manipulation of it and importantly, the storing of it. So if you store data, you're processing it and, and that's quite a relevant definition to think about when it comes to um, what we're talking about today. Now the data subject is the person who, or the individual whose data it is that you're processing and the data controller is the organization that's collecting that data of the data subject um, for the purposes of processing and will be determining how it's processed. And then um, you have data processors who are third parties who will be doing the processing on behalf of the controller. And again, this is quite a, an important definition. I'll talk about a bit more about that in a moment. But um, in, a, in a traditional marketing environment, if you collect email addresses for marketing, you'll be collecting the email addresses of data subjects. You'll be the data controller because you're collecting the email addresses. And if you pass that email list to a third party for the purposes of delivering your email marketing, then the data processor will um, and be the person that will be doing that processing or the marketing person will be the data processor. So in terms of the rules around uh, data protection, um, there's this concept of principles. Now the Data Protection Act has eight principles, um, which are the, the ones, uh, the, 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 the six at the top and then the, the two in the middle. Um, the GDPR actually only talks about six, which are the six at the top and also introduces a seventh, which is about accountability, which is at the bottom. What we're going to be focusing on um, is, is security, but these data protection principles set out what, it's, what you can and can't do with data, and they range from um, processing must be lawful and you must be fair and transparent about your use of data. You only use the data for a specific purpose that you collected it for in the first place, that it's um, data that you need for that purpose, that it's kept up to date and accurate, you only retain it for as long as possible, and that all your processing has to be done securely. Now, the individual's rights and international transfers, they are still in the GDPR, they're just not re referenced as principles. Individual's rights are the, uh, uh, are the rights that a, a data subject has with regards to the use of their data, and that's typically, uh, most people think about data subject access requests, which is the individual's right to say, what data do you hold on me? How do you process it? And um, can I have a copy? Um, those are the kind of things that, uh, um, that the GDPR um, has as well. And in the GDPR sense, there's a, a few additional things to, to look out for things like uh, the right to be forgotten, the uh, right for data portability, the right to be informed and so on. And then international transfer is about not passing data to uh, a processor or processing data outside the EU, EU unless um, there's adequate data protection um, in, in place. So that's particularly important if you're processing or your data is being processed, say, in the, in the, in the United States. And then the big green bar at the bottom is a reflection of actually the GDPR is all about accountability. So this is a seventh principle in GDPR terms, which basically sets out that um, if you are, um, uh, you, you need to demonstrate that you are compliant with the GDPR rather than um, um, somebody having to demonstrate that you're not. So it's all about accountability and I'm sure that will sort of crop up in some of the things that we're talking about um, today. So what's changing with the GDPR? Well, there's quite a lot that's changing and I, I tend to use this fan diagram to demonstrate the 10 key areas. We're not gonna go through all of them because we, we won't be able to get, um, won't have enough time to do all of that. Um, but um, we're gonna focus on, on specific um, areas of, of GDPR. Um, the key thing to, to know about with the GDPR, if you didn't know, is it um, becomes law um, on the 25th of May, 2018. And because it's a European regulation, it applies across the whole uh, of Europe. So all member states have to apply, um, sorry, it applies to all member states regardless of any national laws they might have. So in the UK, it will be replacing our Data Protection Act 1998. As it happens, we're currently, or Parliament's currently debating a data protection bill, which will probably become the Data Protection Act 2018, which essentially implements GDPR into UK law and, and addresses some areas where there's a bit of flexibility um, but um, we are in a two-year grace period right now so um, if you're thinking that you've got plenty of time to think about it you're, you're looking at about um, four months until uh, it becomes law in, in the UK regardless of what might happen with the data protection bill so let's focus on um, the areas that we're talking about um, and let's skip to accountability. Um, I've already mentioned that as part as a key part of um, GDPR and, and kind of the underpinning um, aspects of it. So um, not only is it about uh, empowering users to understand what their rights are and what they can and can't expect from the use of their data, 
but it's about organizations who are collecting that data so the controller and the processors being able to demonstrate their compliance um, and um, in some areas businesses are required by law to record processing activities so that they have that accountability um, accessible and it, they need to cooperate with the regulator which is the information commissioner in the uk um, and thinking about um, um, being able to demonstrate that um, certain things are um, done lawfully um, when it comes to consent which is one of the other areas that's changing which I'm, I'm sure you've heard about because it's uh, something that marketing people tend to get quite excited about um, th there's a requirement that um, you need to record when consent is given uh, if consent is your lawful basis for processing so just remember accountability um, all the way uh, throughout um, if you can demonstrate why you believe that you're acting lawfully then then you're probably in a very good place uh, with regards to uh, any investigation or, or in inquiry that might come from say the information commissioner another area that's um, uh, one of the key areas that's changing is the third party uh, processor so if you're a data processor or you use a data processor then there's some changes that that um, that are coming one of the key things is with Data Protection Act, apart from a few different examples, um, typically actually about um, security, it's down to the controller to make sure that they are using, uh, that they're, they're acting responsibly and, and the buck stops with them. So even if a processor was the cause of a breach, then it would probably be the controller would get into trouble. Under the GDPR, that's all changing, and actually, um, not only will the controller possibly get into trouble, but the, the the data processor will as well. So there's now processor liabilities that didn't exist in, in doesn't exist in, in existing data protection law. So that's something to think about, particularly if you're a processor, and it's important for you to think about: Am I a data controller or a data processor? And in some circumstances, depending on what you're doing with data and, and whose data it is that you're processing, you might be a bit of both. Now, in terms of meeting compliance requirements, um, if you are using a third party processor, then you need to think about whether um, they are GDPR compliant because the law requires you, the GDPR says uh, in Article 28 that you mustn't use a data processor um, unless you are sure that they are GDPR compliant. So there's a good chance that you will need to ask, do some due diligence and ask some questions of those processors you might be using. Um, and it also requires in, in um, Section 3 of Article 28 that you have um, adequate contractual terms in place between the controller and the processor. So again, if you're using a third party processor, you need to make sure you meet those legal requirements. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you might have in a contract or um, so you might need to think about addendum to contracts or you might see in terms of conditions of those third party processors. Now it's worth just re reminding you what I said earlier about the definition of processing. It does cover things like storage. So if you're using third party providers to store your data, they will be the data processor, you will be the controller. So you'll need to look at this um, in, in that context as well. And that's um, one of the things that Sam Salim will be uh, um, addressing in terms of the services that he offers and, and how he's looked at that GDPR compliance. So that's, a significant change using third-party processors or, or data processors as they're referred to in the, in the regulation and of course the uh, thing that lots of people are talking about using scare tactics and and, and the like um, is about the fines obviously if you get it wrong um, there's a potential that you'll be investigated and that you might get fined or in, in some serious situations there are the legal remedies which could lead to imprisonment or, or even personal fines if you were complicit to a, to a breach um, I tend to not talk about fines too much because it's easy to get caught up in the in the top level, which is 4% of global turnover or 20 million euros. In reality, I think we should reflect on um, what the Information Commissioner does now in terms of enforcement because it's clear and they've made it clear that um, they take everything on a case by case basis and uh, and proportion, uh, you know, in a proportional sense. And there's evidence of, of this, probably the best well, um, well known um, or use, useful example is um, there was an NHS trust who shared patient data with Google's DeepMind AI program purely on the basis that um, they believed that AI might be able to help influence better um, health outcomes for, for patients. And so their lawyers got together and they deliberated around the data protection ramifications of all that. And in the end, they shared the data with uh, Google. And Information Commissioner got uh, wind of this and, and investigated and found that actually they were wrong, that their decisions were, were wrong. However, nobody got fined. They had steps put in place to make sure that um, this doesn't happen again. 
and that they put uh, necessary steps in or protocols in place to ensure that if they want to do it, they do it the right way. But nobody got fined. And if you think, well, this is an NHS uh, trust processing uh, sensitive personal data, which is data protection term or special categories as it's referred to in GDPR terms, um, with a global corporate, i.e. Google, and nobody got fined. So I think that's a good reflection on the fact that um, if you get all the, the checks and balances in place, even if some of those may be wrong, um, you might be in a better place than you would be if you didn't have anything to be able to demonstrate your compliance. And that sort of comes back to the accountability bit that we were talking about earlier. So let's talk about um, one of the key areas that we're really on this call or this webinar uh, about, and that's the uh, link between uh, GDPR and, and security. Um, so the security principle, I mentioned that before when I was talking about the principles of data protection, uh, processing must be secure. And what that means is that you have to make sure that um, any processing, remembering that covers everything from your use, your manipulation, your sharing, your storing, and, and, and so on, um, must be done um, lawfully. And you must make sure that it can't be um, un, uh, have unauthorized access to it, that it's not accidentally lost or, or, or destroyed. Um, and uh, it, it's your responsibility to be able to prove that you've got um, adequate data uh, protection security in, in place. Um, and in terms of principles, I know I talked about seven in the GDPR, they refer to this one as the integrity and, and confidentiality uh, principle. So it's about making sure you're maintaining the integrity of the data whilst also maintaining the confidentiality um, of its nature. So that's protecting from unlawful access and, and unlawful processing, um, which you know typically everybody thinks about it all being about hacking and getting access to uh, data on a, a data store somewhere and, and using a, um, a bit of malware or, or something like that to access the data. Well, it's, it's much wider than that. You've got to make sure that somebody isn't able to get into a system and, and delete it, even if they don't download it. Now, in terms of what that means from a practical point of view, we need to sort of look at um, the concept of, of the responsibilities that the controller and the processors have. So these are the data controllers and the data processors are equally responsible for ensuring the security. Obviously, if a processor can't demonstrate that it runs a secure system, then um, the controller shouldn't be using them. But um, there are tools available. So GDPR talks about a concept of data protection by design and default, which is in, in data protection terms is actually a, a, a new concept. It is something in the UK that we've had as best practice under Data Protection Act for quite some time. But this is essentially that whenever you consider rolling out a, a new service or a new way of processing data or you're collecting data in a different way um, or your maybe your server or service or your, your products are, are data um, related you need to consider data protection by default and by design so it's not about um, having an afterthought that you really should have thought about data protection it's data protection has to be at the heart of what you're doing in terms of your product development your service development and so on and there's a tool called the Data Protection Impact Assessment, which um, provides guidance about uh, the kind of things you should be looking for. So um, in terms of your development of products and solutions, if they're involved in the processing of data, you will be having a you will have a responsibility, whether you're a controller or a processor, to make sure that you use DPIAs and you consider data protection by design and default um, before you, you launch because um, you're data subjects, privacy, and data rights need to be uh, sort of the, the, um, the pinnacle of, of what you're uh, trying to achieve with that system as well. And as I say, this is about not making sure that you think of data protection as an afterthought. It's about thinking about it up front. Now, when it comes to actually the security of processing and what that actually means, then there is guidance in the, in the regulation around what that could mean and what kind of things you need to consider. Um, the anonymization of data, if you're processing data, but you don't actually need to know the actual individuals associated with that data, so you, maybe you're doing research or you're processing for the purposes of statistical analysis, if you don't need the person, personal aspects of that data, then anonymize that data and process it. So if you don't need, if you, know, if you need a, a breakdown of data based on, on postal code location, you might keep the postal code, but you don't need to keep the full address and the, and the name then don't keep the full address in the name and, and anonymize that data. Now there is a concept and it's referred to in the GDPR called pseudo anonymization, which is about having um, 
processing data that is on, on the face of it anonymized but has maybe an ID which you can then use to tally that with a, a, a real piece of data and, and, and that's another aspect of doing if you, you need to keep them the secure, I'm sorry, if you need to maintain the integrity of the data as a whole but for the purposes of maybe research or, or, or statistical analysis, you can pseudo anonymize it for the purposes of that um, which then, when that part of processing from a security point of view um, addresses the um, the issue of, well, if that data gets leaked or, or somebody has access to it that they shouldn't do, unless they've got access to the other data that they wouldn't know um, the uh, personal aspects of that data. I hope that makes sense. Um, also, there's this issue of encryption. Everybody's talking about encryption. You know, you have to make sure your emails are encrypted. You have to make sure your documents are encrypted, that everything's stored and stuff like that. Yes, the encryption is one way of demonstrating that uh, you've taken security um, seriously and you know if you're storing data on a hard disk and somebody nicks the hard disk then you need to make sure it's um, encrypted because if somebody is able to plug in that hard disk and get access to the data then you've suffered a breach so um, encryption is certainly a, a tool and a, and a means by which you can address the security of processing particularly to avoid people accessing it when they shouldn't be. You need to ensure the integrity of your system so that's about monitoring and managing the security of your of your um, IT systems or any processes that you have that process um, personal data. And don't forget, security principle also relates to making sure data doesn't get accidentally changed or destroyed. So you need to have a disaster recovery system in place. So that's about having adequate backups and backups that you can access easily, that you've got protocols and processes in place with regards to how data is restored. Um, and um, uh, uh, and as a whole, that's your, your disaster recovery process. Um, you need to make sure that your systems and services are benchmarked against technical effectiveness and doing testing. So, you know, whether that's going down the, the um, cyber security route of, of penetration testing or, or checking or, or, um, or, or whatever, you need to make sure that you can test that, that technical effectiveness of your systems. Um, and you've got to balance all of this with the risk. So. You know, if you're if you're um, uh, you, you don't necessarily have to be able to do all of those things and it might not be relevant, but you need to be able to demonstrate that you've considered them and you've considered what is an adequate approach for you in terms of the security of your processing, which is why it's um, basically a, a risk based assessment. And um, so it's about understanding what could happen and how you can mitigate that. And then also the accountability principle means you've got to be able to demonstrate that you've thought that through thoroughly. Now, if it all goes horribly wrong. Then you're looking at um, not only fines um, and potential fines, but um, there's a sort of a step in the middle of that um, between the, the breach and um, um, and the uh, potential outcome of a, a regulatory fine, and that's the breach notification. So this is something new in the GDPR. Not, not um, some regulated industries, telecoms, for example, um, have a uh, regulatory duty already to report breaches of data, but the GDPR covers this for everybody. Um, it basically says that if you suffer a breach um, that is um, significant and there's a chance of harm to the data subjects, you need to report it to the, um, the regulator and you've got to do that within 72 hours of becoming aware of the breach. Um, and uh, it also means if there's a high risk to the data subjects, then you've got to tell them as well without undue delay. So that's pretty much you having to demonstrate that you did it as quickly as possible. So if there is a breach and there is an issue with your security, um, then not only are you telling the regulator who has the power to find and investigate you, um, you're also telling your customers um, that their data has been at risk and um, they need to uh, possibly act upon um, that notice so that they can then perhaps mitigate any, again, any risk of um, a fraud or, or um, uh, other, other data related risks. And if you do suffer breaches, but they're not ones that you need to report, you still need to pay attention to them because you have a, a, a requirement in, in the GDPR um, that says you have to document and record any of those breaches. Um, and if you, uh, that means that uh, if somebody tells the ICO about it, then they might come knocking and asking you for details as to what that actually was uh, all about. So um, yeah, there's quite a lot to, to think about um, from the GDPR. Um, point of view um, just regarding uh, breaches and how you deal with them. So I'm going to hand you over now to uh, Salim from Storm Internet who's going to talk about 
um, the kind of things that he's been looking at and um, um, how that impacts on the kind of um, services that uh, he provides. And if you just bear with me two seconds, I'm just going to change him over. Okay, Salim, you, you have control. Um, I'll just unmute you as well so that we can hear you. Salim, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can, can you hear me okay? Can yeah, you... that's great. And we can see your Excellent. presentation as well. Excellent. Okay. Uh, great. Did you say you can hear me okay, Mark? Wonderful. Yes, I did. Uh, Great, wonderful. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for that, Mark. Um, what I'm going to do really is just uh, to carry on from where Mark's. So Mark's talked a lot about the GDPR uh, and the requirements involved if um, you get breached. And really, uh, today I just want to kind of expand on that and show you know what Storm are doing uh, and how you know we may be able to help you with some aspects of that. Um, so I've got these initial slides in. Now, these ones I tend to take up when I'm on the road giving a webinar, but I think everyone here today uh, either used Storms, know, knows me, or has used us in the past. Uh, so there's a very brief bit about myself, being in the industry for 20 years, uh, Storm Internet, we've been uh, keeping servers and hosting data safe, secure, running fast since uh, 2004. Uh, we've got over 3,500 customers, predominantly based in the UK. Uh, we're now hosting well over 10,000 websites. Uh, and a key thing, I think, particularly with um, regards to um, uh, this uh, presentation today, is uh, we use only UK data centers. So that essentially means that when you store data uh, on our servers, they will always be within the UK and never go outside of those UK borders, which is now becoming more uh, important than ever. Uh, just a little bit about our awards and recognitions. Um, I guess that those that follow us and seen our mailers, we've uh, won a couple of awards for the past years, predominantly, again, focused on what we do as a host uh, and security. And we've done kind of quite well at the uh, UK Internet Industry Awards, the ISPAs, uh, which we're uh, very, uh, very, very happy about. And there's a couple of uh, uh, those there. Um, but moving on to the agenda, uh, two things I want to talk about. Uh, first one really is how your hosting provider can help you to meet your compliance requirements. Uh, and secondly, really how we uh, can help you to protect your business. And that's really just looking at it from um, the data protection angle, because a lot of people, you know, you, 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 you've got servers with us and you're putting data on our servers. And really, you know, what we can do to really, uh, you know, enhance that further and just really help you tick a lot of the boxes that you need to be doing there. Um, so firstly, how your host network can help you to meet your requirements. So I specifically haven't said uh, Storm here. This is just hosting in general. Um, data controllers, uh, this is a GDPR stipulation. So data controllers uh, yourselves in this case uh, need to carry out due diligence to show they're using GDPR compliant data processes. So exactly as Mark was saying, uh, if you collect personal information on an individual, you are the data controller. And if you're storing that with someone, uh, they are the data processor. So in the case of a host provider, uh, that says you can usually, um, they can usually help you satisfy that criteria by providing you with a detailed GDPR statement. Um, the GDPR statement essentially details exactly what that organization is going to do uh, with your data. So as a hosting provider, if you're storing, you know, client data on systems you have with us, in all, you know, in reality, the host is never, ever going to really look at that data because they don't need to. The host job is really to ensure that server is secure uh, and that it's running well uh, all the time. You know, so there's no need for them to, uh, you know, necessarily go into that. Um, but still, they need to specify that into a statement that you're then able to use uh, and demonstrate to your own clients or the ICO if ever needed that, you know, you've um, you, you've done your due diligence where you're placing that data and it's, you know, all good and secure and who you're using uh, is following GDPR guidelines. Um, I've just thrown in a few other examples here that will probably, you may also need to check because um, as well as using hosts, there's a few others. Uh, there's people like card payment providers. So this is where you might be collecting, you know, if, you're, if you've got an e-commerce site, you're collecting, uh, you know, your customer's name, but then you're passing that on to someone like PayPal or WorldPay to actually process the transaction. You're actually passing a lot, of, you know, likely to be passing the name and address of that customer onto that provider. So that's someone you're going to need to check. 
Same with CRN systems. Uh, there's a lot of obviously uh, personal information stored in those. Uh, mailing systems, MailChimp being a very popular one, uh, where you're sending out um, info, you know, they're, they're, they're now a data processor because they've got, are holding a lot of personal info. Uh, backup providers, as Mark mentioned. Uh, and in short, just really anyone who receives uh, personal data uh, on individuals from you. If you're sending that data out anywhere, that person is now under GDPR uh, policy legislation is now a processor. So you need to be asking them, uh, you know, what their what, what for their GDPR statement and you know what what is their uh, policy on this. Uh, so from us, uh, going back to Storm, we will be fully GDPR compliant from uh, February 2018. We've, we're pretty much in the final stages now of uh, you know sorting all our documentation out and making sure we've got all the policies in place and been working along with Mark to get all that uh, covered. Uh, and for our customers, we're going to be able to issue you with the GDPR statement uh, from uh, Monday the 5th of February. So we'll be able to provide that to um, all of our clients. Uh, so. Uh, essentially, that means that using Storm means you're able to demonstrate that you were using a GDPR compliant provider, uh, and that's a tick in the box uh, for yourselves. You can show that you know that that's one provider you're already using uh, that's compliant, so you haven't got to worry there. So, uh, moving on from that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about you know how we can help to uh, protect your business. Um, so, as well as having the GDPR uh, uh, t things you have to do and cover. Uh, they're obviously, you know, that's one area, but there is the other risk and the other risk is the big data breach. Um, so obviously this is the fear. This is the nightmare scenario. You know, if, if data does go out, uh, it's someone's got in there. Uh, you know, what what do we do about this? You know, uh, and, and what impacts are going to have on the business? So Mark's touched on a lot of this already, I know. Um, but I just want to take it again, just very quickly from the top. Uh, so if you suffer a data breach, what problems does this cause you? Um, straight away, you're going to have a lot of hassle and potentially productive time lost, needing to inform your customers, the information commissioner potentially, uh, and ensuring those GDPR procedures are followed correctly. Uh, the outcome of that, there's potential reputational damage to your business due to clients' data being breached, which potentially leads to a loss of trust from your clients. Uh, and then, you know, there's also the, like Mark spoke about, the fines from the information commissioner's office if the procedures have not been followed correctly. Uh, potential risks from other legal liabilities such as being sued, obviously that depends on what terms you've got in place, you know, with your clients, uh, but they're all uh, risks. And then the final, well, you know, some uh, real large fines are potentially if, um, you know, there was the expected precautions to try and secure that data were never actually taken or it just was deemed to be, uh, you know, unfit. It wasn't adequate enough. Um, like I said, I don't want to go into the whole scaring type of, uh, 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 you know, approach, but I just wanted to kind of try and show some uh, little examples of this as well. So just a few that have occurred recently. There's the famous Talk Talk one, which I think uh, most people have heard about, uh, where they had a big data breach. 156 plus uh, thousand uh, individual records access. They were issued with a 400,000 penalty. Uh, and the attack method, how that actually occurred, was it was uh, they had an out of date database that was gained from an acquisition of a competitor uh, that wasn't secured. So they bought out Tiscally, they got their database, but they never really checked how secure it was. Uh, and that subsequently led to um, the breach happening via a vulnerable web page. So, you know, something that could have actually been avoided uh, had, uh, you know, a little bit more um, uh, work been done just to check, you know, customer data and, and lock it down. Uh, moving on, another example, not in Nottinghamshire County Council. Uh, they had a situation where 3,000 individuals' uh, records were posted online. Uh, they got a slightly smaller, but a 70,000 man fine. Um, however, their attack method was probably even more embarrassing. Uh, what happened with them was they actually had no authentication uh, on the website. So essentially, uh, you could actually go in, potentially look up everyone's details uh, with no need to log in and you know just be able to view your own. And what happened was, uh, I think, I believe a, a search engine spider like Google went out, scanned the whole database, saw it all as public content uh, and posted all these details uh, for a search engine and uh, I think uh, one of uh, uh, an individual found that and uh, obviously uh, reported that and uh, hence how that came about. So uh, yeah, it goes without saying, but any web designers out there, I'm sure you know, make sure that uh, obviously decent authentication is in place at all times. 
uh, uh, car phone warehouse, another one, three million records access. Uh, there was uh, 400, another 400,000 uh, foreign issued. Uh, I think a lot of that was because 18,000 of those um, records had actually payment card info. Um, what happened here, this, you know, was simply down to an out of date WordPress plugin. Um, and it was as simple as that. There's an auto update feature in WordPress, which people that use WordPress will know about. Uh, and it can update itself to bring in the latest security patches. They didn't have it enabled, or we believe it wasn't enabled, but you know, essentially it was out of date. The ICO discovered that uh, it was something that could easily have been protected, wasn't done, and subsequently massive damage. Um, but here I mentioned some big names, but it's not always just the big names that get here. And that's, you know, I think very important to know in, in you know in this uh, 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 talk here. Uh, there's a Berkshire based small business boomerang video uh they're a small um small business but they had twenty six thousand uh, customer details leaked hit with a sixty thousand fine and the attacker got in uh to, to their database using something known as sql injection uh, and for those that don't know what sql injection is that's essentially where especially uh crafted um or malicious bit of code can pick back its way onto uh a legitimate uh, formula so for example they can actually put some malicious code in something as simple as a you know a contact form so where you put your name in uh you can actually um if, if you know what you're doing you can actually um just close it off with a couple of quotes and put in a um a malicious Malicious statement and actually if it's not being validated properly in the back end or there's no protection in place to scan for that kind of thing it's possible to um, attack that site and extract data um, so I've gone through a lot of these not really to scare but also just to show you know how um, these things tend to take place and also what I'm going to lead on to later is a lot of these are simple to protect against it's just really knowing what to do where to look and making sure you're working with people that know these um, you know kind of things and, and, and that you're covering everything that needs to be covered uh, so um, there's more examples if you would like to see you know, the ICO website, it's all under their news section and uh, basically whenever they uh, are release it, they tend to publish it. So, uh, like I was saying, just going from the small business, uh, you know, like I say, small, large business, does it matter? The ICO is you, essentially, they don't care how big you are. Uh, if you're big, if you're small, it's irrelevant. If you are taking any kind of personal information or you're collecting that, you're storing it in a database, uh, you are... Uh, under their watch they will be you know if you get breached it, it, you need to report that um, it, it doesn't matter they, what they care about is it's individuals data uh, and this is going to obviously be as Mark was saying become more enforced with the GDPR uh, coming into place so um, you know even if you're collecting something as simple as a maybe sign up to a newsletter you might be taking someone's name their email address I don't know even a phone number that's all personal info so you know even in some simple circumstances you are still collecting personal information uh, and you need to be uh, uh, very uh, diligent uh, and vigilant of uh, you know these um, you know uh, of looking after and protecting that data so um, just taking an extract from that quote, uh, what are the steps expected to protect people's personal information in line with the law? Um, Mark touched on it with the, um, the uh, data protection by default. Um, but when it goes into, you know, where you store that data and how it's looked, which a lot of this looks at where the breach took place, um, what's going to happen is if you're investigated by the ICO, they come and look at, well, okay, how did this occur? They're likely to benchmark you against something known as the 10 steps to cybersecurity. And that's something published by GCHQ's National uh, Cybersecurity Center. And essentially, it's a guide which covers these 10 areas. Um, and it's basically good practice what you should be doing, uh, in their view, to lock down and secure your data so it's as safe as possible. Um, you'll notice six of them there are in bold. Uh, the reason for that is because those uh, relate to really where that data is stored. And with, you know, if it's in the cloud, that's going to be on a server. Uh, it also leads on to this is an area that, you know, uh, you would have less potentially with Storm if, if you've got on the servers. Uh, and it's something, therefore, that we can help you with. And this is what we're very, very focused. We have been for years, but we're, you know, really sort of now as a business uh, looking more to just help our customers more and more with these uh, areas of data protection. So that is leads me on to my point of saying, you know, uh, Storm offers services to cover all points related to satisfy compliance and service security. So where you've got, you know, what do I do with network security? What do I do with malware protection? How can I protect against this? Uh, you can come to us and we're building up, you know, we're increasing our range of services more uh, by the month, really, to really, you know, do this more and more and better and better for you. So, uh, you know, we're here to uh, help with those kind of things. So, um, 
What does this all mean? Uh, in the event of a data breach uh, being investigated, uh, if you're able to demonstrate you've done everything, you're able to demonstrate, if you do that, you're able to demonstrate you've done everything uh, to, the, to secure a server to the highest level possible. And leading from that, what does that really mean? How does that translate to uh, what it means for you? Well, now you've got significantly less chance of incurring fines from the ICO. Uh, we were, I was saying earlier, it's not, they're not really out to just issue you a fine. They're out really just to see that you've done your best to try and stop this happening. Stop this situation taking place so by you know by following good practice and making sure you've done all you can do you know th th that's going to be looked upon favorably um the spin-off from that and probably more importantly as well is you know you've now got lower uh, risk of reputational damage to your business because you know your security was as good as possible uh you did everything you could uh which leads to no embarrassing stories published demonstrating the company's weakness you know like we just showed in those examples i mean people not authenticating their uh, uh their user forms uh, it, it's a little bit embarrassing because it's something that's easy to pretend and it doesn't look very professional so by doing you know best practice you're going to avoid that risk you know of having something negative posted on your firm out there about you know something that was so simple a uh, lockdown you didn't do it so you're going to do that. Um, and then from that, again, the, the final point, significantly lower risk of, you know, things like being sued or any other legal liabilities, because, again, you've done what you could there. Um, but more importantly, what we like to think, you know, this really means that you actually have less chance of being breached in the first place, which I think is a very important, you know, point here. It's really about, you know, you want your data to be as secure as possible. Um, the way I look at it is, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, securing your house or securing, you know, your car. Uh, you want to be locking that down, not, you know, right away. So no one actually gets into it in the first place and drives it off or breaks into your house. You know, it's, it should be uh, secured. So that situation never even happens. And it's exactly the same thing with data protection. You know, you want to be doing this, viewing those servers and where you're storing that data, you know, in exactly the same um uh, view and uh, you know as a company this is our approach and we think it's a uh, good advice uh, we'd rather be proactive than reactive and we think if you do that you know you're in a you're in a, you're in a good place that way you know I think that's a good way to, to, to tackle uh, you know uh, this particularly um, so I've sort of said the situation I just want to quickly go over you know what do we do to help you achieve this um, so I'll run through this quickly so I'm quite conscious of time as well uh, we're coming up to 10 to 1 so um, how do we help you achieve this well straight away first thing as we mentioned earlier we've been in this business now for over 14 years uh, we've been securing commercial enterprise level service and systems throughout that time uh, and you know we're constantly evolving that um, in addition to that, we have strategic partnerships in place uh, that we've been working on with a number of the best security cyber firms uh, in the world. Uh, some of those include uh, Security Metrics, Cloudflare, and very shortly we'll work in a partnership at the moment with Security, who are a, a malware protection specialist. So we're just in the final uh, uh, talks with them about sorting something out there, and you'll see that announced in the next uh, uh, month or two. We'll be rolling that out into, um, into our uh, portfolio. Uh, and again, that's going to bring extra protection to help protect your data even further. Um, so what does that let us do? It effectively lets us offer a range of effective uh, you know, services to protect you against malware, ransomware, computer viruses. Uh, it means we're able to offer firewall services to protect your website from code injection style attacks like SQL injection and cross-site scripting, uh, as we talked about, where someone can go in and they suck out code from your, uh, you know, from a, uh, a very simple, harmless web uh, page uh, forum. So, uh, you know, by having that firewall there in front of it, that's going to help stop that. So we're able to offer you that. We can do that for you right now. Uh, does PCI services, so that's the payment card industry, vulnerability scanning. Uh, and we're also able, uh, through via security metrics, to provide you with the certification for that. And essentially, for those that don't know PCI, I think probably a lot of people in the audience uh, today do, um, it, what that essentially means is, is, is it means that Visa and MasterCard are happy. They believe your server is secure enough to allow you to store car details on it. They believe, you know, it's, it's locked down enough that it's okay to do that, it's, it's secure enough. So even if you're not taking card information, the good thing about having the PCI service anyway, you know, it's saying that your, your data is locked down to a very, very high standard. Um, and again, just having the certificate, should data ever get breached, if you're able to show, uh, you know, a body like the ICO that, look, this server was secure, look, we've got a certificate and it's PCI compliant, the recent one to prove that, you know, all those things help, that's gonna be you know looked on very favorably because clearly you know um, you had it to the highest current standards that you possibly could get that to uh, and again obviously we're here to um 
you know, as I'm leading on to next, uh, help with that. So uh, as you know, there's, uh, we, we run a 24 seven, three, six, five uh, support team, and that includes uh, security and uptime monitoring. We've got services for that. Uh, our guys are always available. You can come and talk to them through the portal, uh, uh, you know, and they can also monitor your service for anything, uh, you know, uh, if it goes offline, they're already on that, but also any, they can be more specific. So if a certain service doesn't respond necessarily, maybe as it should, we can set custom alerts to look out for that. So like, you know, our guys are on it so you can uh, you know like to say sleep soundly uh, knowing that there's always someone looking over a system you know for you or a port or a service uh, on, on on your system you need you may need watched over or to spot any suspicious signs of any strange activity we've got a team that you know on hand to do that and that's growing all the time because you know as we expand further um, disaster recovery goes back to um, a requirement as well uh, we've got the managed backup so again we can if your data ever did get corrupted you know harmless it wasn't attacked just someone i don't know deleted a batch of files or records that shouldn't have been deleted you know we, we can uh, ensure you've got decent backups in place to make sure they can be restored um and uh you know just a, a flexible range of support levels so we could be there as, as as we say as little as much as you want so some people just you know want to call upon us for advice some people say hey storm look just take care of this i don't want this headache just i'm going to give you this box just look after it i never want to go into it just make sure it's always you know running fine and secure uh, we can do that too uh, and we're growing our services all the time as i've said you know and that's expanding uh, security doesn't stand still and uh, neither do we so uh, just a few things very briefly in 2018, what we're looking to do is to be more uh, of this functionality added directly into your Storm account portal. Um, you'll let, there's a new system coming in, which you're able to add all your websites to and all your servers, and it's gonna actually score them. So that's gonna use our experience and knowledge uh, that we've built up there, and it's gonna give you a score on how vulnerable we see that website or how we see your server. Uh, what needs to be done about that? And again, like I say, um, it, we, we, it can be that we actually just do all that for you. So we wouldn't even notify you if uh, you had that level of support with us or if it was vulnerable, we'll do it for you. Um, but if you don't want that, you just want us to let you know if we see something we think should be better, uh, our, you know, our, we're trying to make our services we do all these already, but what we're trying to do is make our service a lot more intuitive so that you can just come to the portal and it gives you a checklist of things you need to, um, you know, you need to be looking at and it'll take up right away. Uh, and again, just another round we're doing, working with Mark on this, is we're going to expand, bring in the GDPR Security Center. And again, it's just following that kind of checklist flow kind of things. We also want to bring in it, you know, uh, where it's possible, the kind of tick off the boxes that you've done, you know, for, for systems and maybe even documentation to be GDPR compliant. So essentially what you're getting with Storm is, you know, that one-stop shop to really, you know, protect all of your data and just look after you and take away that headache and hassle that, uh, you know, of actually having a manage those systems and worry about data protection you know this is really what we're doing and what we want to improve on you know day in uh day out and just keep you know getting better at and you know th this is really our aim and you know th this is what we're focused on um i just want to finish like i say this is just really some free things you can do right now i always think it's useful to give away just a couple of things because maybe some people aren't doing it uh and there's a few things you could do right now just to make sure your security is as good as possible um, I'll just throw in, ensure your operating system or updates are always enabled for all. And again, I'm not just talking things you've got with our servers, I'm talking about desktops, laptops, tablets, smartphones, uh, you know, your own personal devices. They're all targets now in this digital world we live in. Uh, you know, the, the, more, the, the more we become dependent on them, the more attractive they are to hackers. It, it goes that way. So just simple things like making sure your older updates are on. I know that can be a nuisance a lot of times. People that want the older update is going to, you know, take your phone offline for uh, 20 minutes while it updates itself. It can be a nuisance. but make just i would recommend leave it on there because you know it, it, as we had the other day with the meltdown inspector uh, uh vulnerabilities were announced earlier i think two days after new year uh patches were getting rolled out immediately for that so you know by having those kind of auto updates on you're getting those updates as soon as they become available so just some, you know uh, a little bit of um a recommendation we'd say do that uh same goes for any security uh software make sure your security updates are enabled for those uh as we saw uh with the wordpress breach you know that has an auto update feature a lot of cms software does just make sure those auto updates are enabled so you're always getting uh known vulnerabilities patched asap the problem with known vulnerabilities is that hackers know about them too and if it's something that's very popular like wordpress it tends to get exploited very quickly because they're like great oh this vulnerability let's go go and you know see see who's who hasn't patched their system and they try and attack that's why those uh, uh, software patches are so important. Um, 
use the storm portal. There's a lot of tools already in there. We've got our security center building up. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do right now. One is to run it through Cloudflare. Uh, for, we, 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 for our partnership, we can do a lot of the functionality for free for you. Uh, we've got more you know, services you can get for us that are free that you wouldn't necessarily get directly with Cloudflare. So use the tools that are freely available. That Just by enabling a website, if you've got to run through Cloudflare, it already gets a good level of protection, a lot more you know, than not running it through that, we would say. Um, and expanding on that, there's also the web application firewall service. You can enable that directly from your portal as well. Uh, and that what that's going to do is going to help you know filter out malicious code injection style attacks to stop those ever hitting your website you've got a nice defense barrier right in front of your site um and server you know at all times there so a lot of that like i say is ready in the pool uh, and ready to be used and please do use it you know you're you, if you if you're with, you're with us uh, you know you're using us for your hosting your service uh we will we'll make as much as we can available to you so whatever's there just you know go for it Get, you, please please do take advantage of that um final one i we recommend now if you've got a site put an ssl certificate on it in the old days it was pretty much you only put on a a, a data collecting page such as a form page or a page that collected payment info now it's recommended put it on all your pages so have a redirect on your homepage to always, if it goes to the HTTP non-secure URL, always redirect it to the HTTPS one. And again, that can be done uh, with a little uh, little bit of tweaking um, to uh, a few uh, few rewrite rules on your site. Your developer uh, would know how to do that. Or if not, just come to us. We can help you with that too. Um, and finally, like I say, PCI vulnerability scanning. We offer that as a service uh, through uh, Security Metrics, our partner. Uh, and we can put that on a site level or a server level, uh, you know, it, right down to, you know, to secure whatever it is you need secured uh, make sure that you're certified and that system's as locked down as possible so that's all there um and finally i think like i say you know i say it all the time we're always here for you uh we're online 24 7 our support guys work you know uh, every day of the year they were working christmas day uh you know all through the christmas period they worked they're here for you uh do use them uh go into the portal contact them anytime we want to help you if you've got any questions even just want some general advice just you know uh, talk to us we, we, we want to you know we want to do everything we can for you just let us know uh, and we're there for you. And finally, uh, I just put my email on the bottom there. If anyone wants to contact me directly, that's my email. Uh, send me anything and I'll get back to you, um, you know, as quickly as I can to uh, any questions or recommendations or suggestions. Uh, I'm fully accessible. Just let me know what it is I can do and I'm um, more than happy to help. Uh, finally, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. And I will, uh, on that note, hand back to Mark. Uh, thanks, Aline. That was uh, really interesting and, and uh, yeah, great list of things that you're doing and the, and the ways you can help as well. Um, I'm just going to take control back of the, the presentation. Um, so hopefully you're back to, to my slides now. Uh, just very quickly, um, don't forget if you've got questions, um, use the question panel to, to ask those and we'll pick those up in a minute. We're, we're um, running a bit over, but um, we've got uh, some time for questions if you've got any. Um, Salim's talked about some of the ways that his services can help and I'm going to um, just tell you very briefly about the things I do. So one of the services I run is called Digital Compliance Hub. It's an online service, um, covers more than GDPR, it looks at privacy and marketing compliance and, and, and web and data security as well. Um, it's part information guidance and toolkits and part a helpline. So if you've listened to um, some of the things that we've talked about today um, and you're wondering how do you uh, address these, then uh, from a GDPR point of view, you'll probably find the hub's got some answers there. And if it hasn't, or if you've got a very specific thing, you can book a, a support call or um, or uh, have unlimited access to uh, email support. If that kind of service isn't your thing, then I also run an online, uh, sorry, I also run a consultancy, um, which uh, offers everything from GDPR compliance audits to uh, data protection management and uh, by the hour consultancy. So if you, um, if you want to have a chat about um, how those can help with your business, then uh, as Salim had his email up, up mine's there. Um, you know, ping me an email, and we can we can have a conversation about how that might be able to help with your business, and uh, we can talk about some of the things we've talked today, or even much wider uh, GDPR things. Um, so that brings us to the Q and A session. We've got a few questions coming through, so uh, keep those coming. Um, as I say, you should have a questions tab in your control panel. Um, and we uh, will pick those up. What I'll do is uh, I'll just check, uh, Salim, if you um, unmute yourself, um, I'll, um, I'll call out any questions that um, uh, anybody uh, has that you might want to answer. So I'll just quickly look at those. Uh, interesting question from uh, Richard asking, um, do server logs require consent? 
so from a, a legal point of view, from a GDPR perspective, um, you would need to declare that you're collecting that kind of data and that, and that that data, if it's if it relates to personal data, then you would define that as either as part of your your information you provide when you provide the service, like your terms and conditions. Um, but um, it's the kind of stuff that you would expect to find in a privacy notice. So a privacy notice um, or a privacy statement of some form, because privacy notice is typically on websites, but you would have a statement um, in other forms as well, maybe. Um, would set out that you, um, as part of your service, you may have server logs which will um, be able to identify them via an IP address and that these things, um, this amount of data is, is stored and, and defining what you, what you do with it. So, no, you, I wouldn't say you need consent, but you need to be open and transparent about the fact that you um, have server logs and, and that information is, is, is available um, to, to you and, and how you, you use it. Uh, another question, um, are personal non-business websites also liable? Um, very quick answer on that one. Um, the answer is if they collect personal data, um, then they probably are. Um, it depends. So, so the Data Protection Act doesn't apply to us in our daily lives, so we don't need to worry about our phone book so that we know how to contact our friends. Um, but uh, if you're running a website and you're doing something with personal data for other people, then then you're possibly stepping over into a, a realm where GDPR would would, have, would apply. So, um, so I, I say I think the quick answer to that is is, is yes. Right. Now, here's a question for you, Salim. Um, is PHP my SQLI still sufficient or should we be using PDO? PHP or PDO? Yeah. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, I think uh, PHP, I believe, is okay. Uh, as, but again, as long as it's secured, as long as you're on, you know, as it, 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 you're running the latest updates, PHP has evolved, so you've got um, uh, more uh, recent versions out there. So, PHP, as far as I know, yeah, it's still uh, completely fine to develop in that. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend that you've always got the uh, the latest uh, versions on. Uh, you're using a, 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 the latest, you're developing the latest version of PHP. Okay, great. And so, uh, from a service provider point of view, uh, do you make sure you've got the latest versions running um, and available? But it, I'm guessing it's down to the developer to make no, sure they're using. No, so what we would do, um, this this would be because we if we go and update PHP on a server, um, that could potentially kill off a website that was dependent on that older version. Uh, so if it's a dedicated server, we you know we can do. This is what I was saying earlier about the management. Um, if so, if you for example, if you've got a dedicated server with us and you want us to say, look, just tell me everything that's uh, uh, you know not right with this, um, we can spot. So to be honest, a PCI scan would pot, spot you're running the wrong version or an outdated version of PHP. We wouldn't automatically update it because if we do, we say, yeah, we're going to do that tonight, midnight tonight. You might find next day your customers come in and your website's dead uh, and you actually can't take orders and you're running around trying to get it all patched up and everything as you know as uh, uh, to get it working again um, what we suggest instead is it's stage you don't tend to get uh, uh, you know any t any form of development language just Now, same as like Windows operating systems, 2008, uh, you know, it, it's going to be non-supported from 2020. So already we know that. Um, but you can plan around that you've got time. If a critical vulnerability comes out of it, that's where your auto updates uh, usually can step in to patch that specific vulnerability. Um, but we wouldn't go in and do it. If you asked us to, we would then normally schedule that. So we'll say, yep, okay, we can do it this weekend. Uh, but if you've got a site, let's do this in a, a you know a sandbox or a different environment first to make sure that you're you know you're okay because we're not the developer. We're more you know we take more of the uh, the hosting approach to it. So it's more the developer's got to tell us, yep, the new site is completely compliant with the new version go ahead update that system uh, and we'll you know we'll then absolutely go ahead and do it but in terms of the proactivity this is something you know that a would happen if you have if you've got pci running that's going to spot that right away um, but b as i said going forward we're kind of increasing the um the security portal to try and bring in those kind of things that they become actually more you know even if you haven't got PCI, it's all kind of showing there so you see those things uh quicker but so yeah the long and short the the the, the long so you you can we can do it for you um 
but that tends to be something you want to think about before you actually go and just update something uh, because there are consequences potentially to anything that's dependent on you know that infrastructure before you go ahead and do that so i just suggest you know playing it properly uh and uh, obviously you know we can definitely help you execute um the rollout uh as and when you need that yeah great okay um an another one for you um salim um just can you clarify something you said on your things that can be done for free slide um you mentioned the installation of ssl certificates um and somebody's um just questioning whether that is strictly true because uh, typically you have to pay for an ssl certificate um yeah you do you at the moment what we're looking at is um, let's encrypt which is going to let everyone you know pretty much have a free ssl on their site um the problem we've had in the past of ssls is that they've been dependent on a dedicated ip address um, and with ipv4 is getting less and less and less as they're almost exhausted now um there's been costs associated with that which is why um you know, we've charged for them. The other reason for the charge is if you get an SSL from someone like Global Sign, which is seen as an authority, they charge a fee for it because essentially you're paying for their name. Um, Let's Encrypt's got quite popular um, and it is uh, given away free. Um, and we're looking at making it available to all. Um, it definitely can be done on dedicated. We're looking at putting that potentially out on shared uh, hosting soon. At the moment, it's not there yet. Um, so you'd still you can go for an alpha ssl uh, or something but you know but on dedicate cloud yeah absolutely there's no charges there you can put less encrypt on right away uh i don't believe um you know that you, you can run multiple, i believe you can run multiple sites on the same ip with that as well so um there's not even any extra ip charges either for that so that you know is, is definitely uh, something but in terms of the free things uh, there's also things like uh like cloudflare you've got that that's available to everyone free from the portal um, the security center, you know, the, the, the next version of that's coming later this year. That's free to everyone. Uh, that's going to, you know, you can put your sign up. That can give you a score. All those things are free. So basically what we can make free where we're not getting charged, where, you know, it's feasible, like there isn't something like a, a shortage of IPs or something to uh, consider here. Um, we're going to make available, you know, our, our value is really just making the, um, you know, service as valuable as possible for our customers and giving them, uh, you know, what, what they want and, you know, what, what we can do. So uh, you'll see that, like I say, expanding further. But but yeah, in answer to that, there are free things in there. Just, you know, go take a look around uh, like a Cloudflare. And uh, if that's not enabled, go ahead and enable it. It's definitely a very good feature. We'd recommend, uh, uh, you know, putting on uh, right away. And there's no charge for that. OK, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, so we're, 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 we're overrun, but we've got a few more questions. So we'll just um, pile away through those. And then um, and then we probably need to, to, to call time. Um, so uh, somebody's asked whether the entire presentation will be available at, um, at the end. Uh, the answer to that is yes, we'll provide a, a link to a um, recording of that. So that was an easy one. Um, uh, Rich is asking, where does data processing begin? Uh, for example, uh, when a website visitor clicks the send button on a contact form. Um, basically, data processing will relate to anything where you are doing something with that data, be it the storing, the um, the collection, the, the manipulation, or, or whatever. So I, I would say that... Uh, as soon as that data is in your control as a data controller, then you will be doing some form of processing and that's when it would begin. Uh, uh, Tim's asking about, um, for example, Dropbox, what happens with storage data outside the EU? Um, well, this is one of the principles of Data Protection Act and also is in the GDPR. Basically, if you store or process data outside the European Union, you need to be sure that the the uh, company that uh, is and and um, they operate in a country that has adequate data protection. Dropbox, U.S. business, U.S. doesn't have adequate data protection, but they do have um, a, a service that used to be called Safe Harbor, but uh, sorry, a system uh, between the EU, EU and the U.S. called Safe Harbor that got poo pooed by um, European Parliament and the courts, um, and so they've got a new thing called the um, I think it's called Privacy Guard. Um, which um, basically sets out the rules by which um, businesses should operate um, in terms of processing EU data. So what you should be looking at with Dropbox and indeed any of these other providers, Mailchimp's another example. Um, not not all of them, but um, you know if you look at Microsoft, for example, they they've got quite a lot in their trust center about how you can um, change where your data is hosted and all those kind of things. Um, but things like Dropbox and Mailchimp, you need to be looking at what they um, are saying about GDPR, whether they're signed up to this uh, privacy guard, um, and uh, that they are GDPR compliance. Those are the kind of things you want to do. But 
but um, that's a very oversimplification of the um, adequacy of data protection controls within GDPR. There's much more to it in terms of things like binding corporate rules and other contractual things that might, ena might enable you to, to share data either internally within an organization or, or externally. Um, and then um, a final question from Richard, just for clarification, liability lies with the controller and processor. Um, so the answer to that question is, is yes. Um, if the controller is involved in processing and the processor, a third party processor is doing the processing um, as well or instead of on behalf of the controller, then, then there is a liability for, for both. The difference with the GDPR is the GDPR introduces the concept of liability for processors, which didn't really exist under, under the previous uh, regime. Um, so in a uh, website owner, developer, provider um, scenario, um, the customer whose website it is has responsibilities to make sure that their uh, data processing activities through their website are GDPR compliant, um, which might mean that they need to check with people like um, Salim for the, for the hosting and, and the, the hosting provider. If they do that through a developer, then it might be asking the developer questions around how do they guarantee that the development of the website is, is GDPR compliant and so on. Um, it is going to come down to the investigation as to what that actually means in real terms. If the ICO asks the, the website owner, you know, you're, you're, not, um, you're not compliant and they might just slap them with a fine or if they do an investigation, if the website owner can demonstrate that as far as they were concerned, they had all the checks and balances in place and it was the processor, be that the um, the, the hosting provider or otherwise that um, caused the, the problem, then it may be that both get um, issued with fines or it may be that the, the blame gets shifted to the, to the third party. It really is done on a case by case basis. So there's no clear answer. But in terms of um, in terms of how that might be enforced, but in terms of um, responsibility, everybody who is processing data, either themselves on behalf of somebody or passing it to somebody to do the processing for them, has a responsibility and a liability. Um, so that does mean website owners, um, developers, and, and hosting providers like uh, Storm. So um, I'm conscious of the time. It's just gone 10 past one. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, we will circulate a, a recording of the, uh, the presentation so you can catch up on that on your, uh, in your spare time and uh, revisit any of the questions that we, uh, we uh, hopefully answered for you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Salim, for, for um, coordinating it all. Yeah, thank you for everyone for attending as well. Uh, thank you, Mark.